My god, it's full of stars. As Atari Archive looks into the history of Activision's Star Master. We have yet another Mia Culpa, as in researching this video I found that Empire Strikes Back actually didn't start reaching stores until July. So that's been pushed back a little bit, with me suffering with egg on my face if we're not spotting that sooner. So flying solo this video is Activision's other VCS release for June, and if I may editorialize, it is one of the finest games on the platform. With Star Master, Alan Miller continues 1982's trend of making VCS knockoffs of Atari's 8-bit masterpiece Star Raiders, with what is an excellent balance between complexity and approachability within the system's limited number of inputs. A trend started in April by a magic Star Voyager, and one that would culminate with Atari's VCS version of the game later that year. Atari's own Star Raiders conversion won't come along until about October 1982, so I don't want to delve into it too deeply yet. But with Star Master, it's unavoidable to discuss its inspirational work. Star Raiders, developed by Doug Neubauer, was an action-oriented take on the popular Star Trek computer game originally written by Mike Mayfield. Much as in that turn-based program, Star Raiders requires players to fly a spacecraft through various sectors, scanning for enemy ships. Unlike Star Trek, Star Raiders puts you in the cockpit, operating your ship's shields and weapon systems in active, Star Wars-esque dogfights against your marauding foes, who, left to their own devices, will surround and destroy your space stations, the only places you can stop to refuel and repair your ship if you've taken damage. Much as in Star Trek, you were scored at the end based on how quickly you cleared the map of foes and how many space stations survived. Star Master carries over many of these gameplay elements. The galaxy map is smaller here, and the enemies aren't varied as they are in Star Raiders, but you do have four star bases that you need to defend against your opponents lest they surround and destroy them. Your ship has an energy supply that is constantly ticking down and drains faster as you warp between sectors, fire your lasers, or get hit by enemy fire. You can still take damage, which requires a starbase visit to repair. And once again, you are scored based on your speed and the starbase's surviving, as well as how many times you needed to visit a starbase. In comments reported by Michael Blanchett of the Chicago Tribune, Miller said that he tried to portray a variety of challenges and skill requirements to simulate the feeling of being in space, with players needing to familiarize themselves with the controls and make strategic use of their energy reserves to succeed. In a 1982 interview with Electronic Games, Alan Miller remarked that he had been playing a lot of Cosmic Conflict for the Odyssey 2, another first-person space game, where you're shooting at enemy ships with a limited energy supply. Your ship is largely stationary in Cosmic Conflict, with no discernible forward motion. Miller said in his interview that the idea came to him from playing this that if the starfield could move towards the player, it would feel more realistic, even though, strictly speaking, Cosmic Conflict's starfield would be accurate to moving through space. At the same time, he made the Star Raiders connection clear in his 1999 interview with Digital Press, where he indicated Star Master was similar in concept and that he wanted to replicate the same feeling of flying through space that Neubauer's game provided. In all, he added, the game took him about four to five months to complete. The technical achievement was clear early on. Bob Smith, author of Star Voyager, recalled to me in our 2021 interview that he sought to produce a double-line resolution first-person space game with enemies and stargates that grew in size, which was quite an achievement on the VCS hardware. At the same winter consumer electronics show trade event that Imagic debuted its initial games, however, Activision was also displaying Star Master for the first time, which Smith noted was a single-line resolution take on the same perspective. It also carried over much of the gameplay complexity of Star Raiders, whereas Star Voyager was focused much more heavily on the action aspects. Musically, the games are distinctive too. While Star Voyager has its attempt at the alien tones from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Star Master features a reasonable rendition of the opening notes to the symphonic piece, also Sprach Zarathustra, which featured prominently in 2001 A Space Odyssey. In a blow to black and white TV owners and presumably colorblind players alike, Star Master relies heavily on color to describe the game action. Rather than waste cartridge space to design an explosion graphic animation, Miller instead opted to flash the screen one of three colors depending on what was happening. A red explosion means you've hit an enemy, a yellow explosion means they've hit you, and a blue explosion means you've successfully destroyed an enemy shot. Additionally, the color of your control panel shifts depending on the situation in the sector you're in. 
If it's green, it's an empty sector. A red panel denotes at least one enemy ship, and a blue panel indicates you've entered a space station sector and can dock to repair and refuel. As a space safing consideration, it makes sense and works reasonably well, but at the cost of some accessibility. You may not necessarily need the color to play the game, but odds are you'll need to spend a lot more time checking your energy supply and keeping a mental track of your foes to ensure you're not wasting time or taking damage. So how do you bring the complexity of Star Raiders to the PCS? Star Voyager trimmed it down to an action game. Atari's own Star Raiders shipped with a keypad controller and overlay for the second controller port. Miller took a different tack with Star Master, instead utilizing the console's switches itself. By flipping either a difficulty switch or the color switch, you'll shift over from your cockpit view to the galactic map screen. Here, you select what coordinates you want to warp to, and after pushing a button on the controller, you'll begin jumping to that location. While transiting, you'll be menaced by asteroids, though these can be largely avoided by moving diagonally the entire time. Each warp takes a specific amount of fuel shown on the ship's computer, or MAC, as you flip between sectors, so it's important not to be wasteful in your movements. The MAC will also display your current energy reserves, the stardate, any damaged systems, and the difficulty level. And there are four difficulty levels in Star Master, each adjusting the number and the speed of your enemies, their fire, and the meteors that come at you while warping. On the lowest difficulty, you only have nine enemies to clear out to win, increasing to 17, 23, and 31 between the next three game modes. Meanwhile, the speed multiplies by 1.5, 2, and 2.5 times the base level found in game mode 1. These are labeled in the manuals Ensign, Leader, Wing Commander, and Star Master, and each are denoted on the game screen by their first letter. While it's not explicitly laid out in the manual, in my experience it's easier to get system damage when shot at higher difficulty levels. That could just be because shots come at you so much faster that you inevitably get hit more often. Speaking of system damage, it's pretty much a roll of the dice on which, if any, system gets thrown for a loop when you take a hit. If your weapons are out, you can no longer fire. If engines are damaged, your warps will take twice as much energy as they normally would. If sensors are out, you can no longer see enemy fighters on your galactic map. And if you lose shields, you will be instantly evaporated if you're hit one more time. Considering the action does not pause while you're in the galactic map screen, you need to be ready to react very quickly on the console and get out of danger if that happens. Meanwhile, much as in Star Raiders, the enemy ships are constantly on the move. Every so often they'll jump to an adjacent sector seeking to surround a specific starbase. They'll always start with the bottom right, then the top left, then the bottom left, and finally top right. If they're able to surround a starbase for long enough, it will be destroyed with an explosion visible anywhere in the game world. On higher difficulty levels, you need to be an extremely sharp shot to eradicate enemy fighters in time to protect all four starbases, and each one destroyed will earn you a points penalty when the game tallies up the final score. Speaking of, the final score is shown on the galactic map at the conclusion of the game. You earn 100 points for each enemy ship destroyed, and are penalized 500 points for a lost starbase, 100 points every time you need to dock with a starbase, and 1 point for every stardate that elapses, which happens every 4 seconds. Each difficulty level starts you with a base score that is then adjusted based on your performance to land on your final points total. Much like other Activision titles, Star Master does have a high score patch, the Order of the Supreme Star Master. The company even produced extra chevrons based on the difficulty level you completed. Perhaps an acknowledgement for the game's complexity, Star Master shipped with not one, but two manuals. The first, as you'd expect from Activision, is a relatively short document describing how the game works. The power of Star Master, on the other hand, is much more in-depth, describing how the game's systems and mechanics work in detail. It's clear Activision staff recognized that Star Master wasn't really like any other game on the platform to date, and so some additional information may be necessary for players to truly get the hang of it. And honestly, all this effort paid off. Star Master is a joy to play in probably the most accessible Star Raiders-esque game available in its day, or even now. Sessions aren't particularly long, and as you get the hang of the game's strategy and sharpen up your aim, you'll increasingly have a good time with it. The only knock against Star Master is that it doesn't really have any randomization elements outside of your damage. The enemy fighters will always attack the same bases and have the same starting positions and numbers. Nevertheless, at the highest difficulty level, you'll be hard-pressed to efficiently clear the map without losing any bases. The visuals are clean and easy to understand in the way Activision excels at. 
And while using the console itself can be awkward, depending on your setup, it sure beats wrangling with another controller. Upon its release, Activision appears to have held a late summertime promotional tournament in conjunction with the TV show Greatest American Hero, circa August and September. Dubbed the Star Master Challenge, players would grab an entry form at a participating store before sending in a photo of their high score. Six winners and two guests were each flown out to Hollywood to film a special segment of the TV show. Due to union rules, this special version of the episode never made it to air, but each of the winners received a copy of the episode as well as a VCS. Perhaps of special note, one of the winners was future EGM editor Ed Semrad, who at the time was a champion VCS Asteroids player and would, within a year, begin writing a video game column for the Milwaukee Journal. This wasn't Activision's only promotion for the game either. In December, the company announced the Star Master Space Shuttle Challenge, where players were encouraged to mail in their best scores on the Star Master difficulty level. The top 33 entrants in the three age categories received a Star Master poster and a piece of the Skylab space station, which had been deorbited in 1979 after not being occupied for five years. The top three additionally won a Star Master themed jacket and a chance to compete for the grand prize an expense-paid round trip to the Kennedy Space Center to watch the Space Shuttle Challenger launch on July 4th, though this mission was eventually pushed back to August 30th, and it's unclear if Activision rescheduled around this. Star Master met with seemingly universal praise from reviewers at the time. Lou Hudson of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram gushed over Miller's title, calling it the best home game he'd ever seen, rivaling arcade titles in complexity and difficulty, before going on to praise its visual and aural design, and the fact that even when you get good at it, the game can still wallop you thanks to the randomization of the damage you take. Hudson devoted a whole second column to it days later, not only providing advice on how to do well in the game, but throwing on even more praise by describing Star Master as a turning point in game design, on par with Miller's own basketball or the introduction of programmable consoles with the Channel F. The Video Game Updates review gave it a perfect four stars in both graphics and gameplay, referring to it as a game complex enough to challenge a sophisticated player. Richard Edwards gave the game a glowing write-up in Space Gamer, summarizing it as fantastic and describing it as perhaps not as good as Star Raiders for the Atari computers, but with better sound and color, and more importantly, it was playable on the VCS. His only complaint came from the tactic of it just moving in a corner direction to avoid obstacles while warping. Electronic Games praised the usage of the color switch to flip between viewpoints and noted the game's staying power and replayability. Both reviewers in Logical Gamer's second issue wrote about how much they enjoyed Star Master. Considering it one of their favorites for a stacked month of releases, praising the galactic map and the game's constant progression, the computer display, and visual effects, only nitpicking that the graphics overall are only fair by Activision standards, and that the aforementioned warp sequences are easily defeated by holding left or right. The British TV Gamer magazine referred to it as the best of the Star Raiders style games available, slightly edging out Atari's own VCS version. Beyond these reviewers, we also know that in Video Game Updates, a reader survey published in May 1983, that it also received multiple mentions as a favorite game, albeit not enough to crack the top nine. Bill Kunkel and Arnie Katz gave Star Master a certificate of merit in the 1983 Archie Awards, where it lost out to a Magic's Demon Attack for Video Game of the Year. We don't have solid sales figures for this game, but it wasn't listed in Jim Levy's 1984 comments regarding the company's million sellers. In a January 1983 interview with the Wall Street Journal's Stephen Sansweet, Miller noted Star Master was his best-selling game, so it was probably a solid seller for the company. Interestingly, he added in that interview that his next game, Robot Tank, is an expansion upon Star Master's concepts of the player as a first-person pilot. While Star Master doesn't have quite the same bells and whistles as imminent releases such as Star Pass Phaser Patrol or the Intellivision Space Spartans, it plays great, looks great, and on the whole is an excellent clone of Star Raiders given that it's running on stock VCS hardware. Phaser Patrol is by all rights a more impressive take on this game, but it's also one that uses the Supercharger, which includes 6 kilobytes of memory on the device. Space Spartans not only utilizes the comparatively powerful Intellivision hardware, but also uses the IntelliVoice add-on to include its voice samples that explain what's happening in-game, though it takes an even more unique approach to repairs and features multiple waves of enemies. Even Atari's Star Raiders VCS port manages by running on a bank-switched 8KB cartridge instead of Star Master's baseline 4KB, and as noted requires a specialized controller. 
With these competing titles in mind, Sturminister is all the more impressive for what it pulls off within its limitations. This is one of the highlights on the entire platform, and one well worth seeking out. Next time, Apollo is back with another wave of games.